the land of 10,000 lakes, a remarkable movement was born. Welcome to Hometown Hero Outdoors. We are dedicated to honoring our military service members, veterans, and first responders by providing them with unforgettable outdoor recreational opportunities. We believe those who have served and sacrificed so much for our country and communities deserve a chance to reclaim their spirit and find healing in the great outdoors. This is Hometown Hero Outdoors. And welcome back to our Hometown Hero Outdoors listeners. We have another Wednesday here with the podcast. It's been an exciting uh, week or a couple weeks going on around the organization. Just to give a little update, you know, there's things going on all over the country. You know, a couple weeks ago, we had the Hometown Hero Outdoors Texas Chapters uh, banquet down there. That was pretty phenomenal. Phil was gracious enough to do a sit-in for me for one of the podcasts. I was spent. It was a very long couple days, uh, that weekend especially. And uh, Phil, Phil came in clutch and helped me out with helping out Pete Rittmasters. So thank you, Phil. I appreciate you there. And then this past weekend uh, was really busy as well. Now, just here in Minnesota alone, there's a handful of different events. And throughout the country, there was more. So we've been busy and we're in the, the depth of the fall and hunting season. And a lot of people are still fishing at that. So this past weekend was kind of interesting. Um, it was a very busy weekend for myself as well, as well as the Minnesota team. And just wanted to talk real quick about what we experienced this past weekend. Well, uh, first, I had the opportunity to head down to Worthington, Minnesota. Uh, do a pheasant hunt with our nobles county chapter pheasants forever jackson county pheasants forever and round lake sportsman's club and it was a very awesome and unique experience where we had 15 veterans that were able to get in the outdoors and go pheasant hunting with these phenomenal individuals with all expenses provided and paid for for our veterans so it was awesome but one of the things i wanted to talk about though is the speech that i gave to these individuals this past weekend about how important our mission is and what they do for it without them we can't do what we do we cannot take individuals into the outdoors and how give them that mental health healing with, that they receive when they're in the outdoors. So it was very vital for them to hear that. And w- one of the big reasons that I bring that up is the camaraderie that is built on these trips are built through these adventures that they're in the outdoors, getting to know these people, being able to relate, create these relationships that last a lifetime outside of the service or as a first responder, which brings me to that morning before I went to Nobles County, Worthington area which was the Cole J. Lutz Memorial Suicide Awareness and Prevention Walk. This is our ultimate goal, is our mental health, to keep people alive, keep people on this planet. They can create, uh, continue their relationships with their families, friends, community, as well as enjoy their life. So the trips that we go on, such as the Nobles County Pheasants Forever hunting trip, was very vital to the this our organization and trips alike. In order to create those bonds, have this walk, raise awareness, and tell people that it's okay to not be okay, just don't stay there. So as we continue throughout the organization and doing what we do, I just want to give a big shout out and thank you to everyone who's helped provide a trip, take people in the outdoors. And I hope to see more of that happening and continuing to happen. And then on top of that, we also had a sturgeon trip on the St. Croix River here with some law enforcement officers, a group of five, and we were very gracious. We were able to have a Minnesota-bound film crew come out and talk to everyone. So... But yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Just please keep these trips coming in and helping our individuals out. They really need it and uh, they matter. And a lot of them are feeling some stressors with our veterans when it comes to what's happening overseas between Israel and and Ukraine. So it's very important for us to ensure that these trips are occurring and we're able to help them out. But so it was a very eventful weekend. So again, thank you very much, everyone. But today we have an awesome podcast here. We have Sam Daly with Believe It Canine Service Partners. We will read his bio here in a moment, but I have my co-host here, Phil Ewart as well. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here today. Uh, so Sam, Sam is the founder and former executive director of Believe It Canine, located in Northfield, Minnesota. Owner of Northfield Kennels, Inc., served two deployments to Helmand and Province, Afghanistan in 2012 and 2013. Attached to the U.S. Marines 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, and the 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force, respectively, as a civilian bomb dog trainer and forward support representative. After this assignment, believe it was found so I could, Sam, could uh, continue to serve his country to serve injured military veterans and improve the greater community. In rural Northfield, Minnesota, with my wife, Deborah, and five Labrador Retrievers, He enjoys running and judging the AKC performance events for retrievers, songwriting, playing the guitar, 
and sh shooting sports, hunting, fishing, and woodworking. So, Sam, thank you very much for being here today. Sounds like you have a pretty uh, colorful history and you've been through some things yourself and looks like you're continuing to do things and enjoy life. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. No, it's awesome that you're here. So how we got connected was through Phil, and Phil is here with my, my co-host tonight. Thank Hello. you, Phil, for making the connection. I want to say hi to the listeners and tell us a little about your connection with Sam. Yeah, um, I have not met Sam until tonight, but one of my co-workers is friends with Sam. So we have a mutual friend named uh, Todd Fuchs. Uh, Todd's in IT. He works for the same company that I do. And we got to talking about dogs as Todd is a uh, trainer of hunting dogs. And he had mentioned to me that he had a, a good friend of his uh, who had this organization uh, when I told him about our podcast. And I thought, what a perfect marriage, I guess, of two organizations where Hometown Hero Outdoors takes people into the outdoors, veterans, law enforcement, first responders, and Sam trains dogs to help those veterans uh, who might need help, um, you know, uh, some sort of help with, with a dog as far as uh, that with that mental health. Uh, so I just figured we'd have him on and, and kind of talk about what he's doing. That's awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for the connection. It's very exciting, especially because you have served Sam and you have quite the experience with dogs and being a civilian bomb, to, bomb dog trainer. That's pretty phenomenal. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where are you from? Where you grew up? Where are you, where you hail from? You know, where, where did you grow up and how did you get into being so connected with our canine friends? Sure. So I grew up in Northfield, Minnesota, uh, went to school there. I uh, lived briefly uh, in southwest Wyoming and uh, moved back home until I took the assignment you mentioned uh, with the bomb dogs, where I moved to North Carolina, uh, Southern Pines, North Carolina. It's about uh, 40 minutes from Fort Bragg. And uh, this was a it was it was a good it was a good opportunity and a good time for me to do that. And it was ended up being sort of a surreal uh, life changing experience. Um, so we we trained uh, over 600 uh, bomb dogs in a, about a six year period there. I personally was in on um, uh, in the neighborhood of 60 of those. And then the, the, Marine, the Marines would actually come to our location in North Carolina, train with us for five weeks. And then we would go to their bases and train with them, you know, on their turf. Uh, and one thing sort of led to another. Um, as a trainer, I never imagined that I would end up being uh, deployed, but uh, that opportunity was uh, available and I gladly accepted. Um, I have spent my life uh, camping and hunting and uh, certainly uh, no stranger to the outdoors. And so uh, it was like the worst camping trip I've ever been on, but uh, I was also pretty well prepared, uh, you know, for those uh, conditions. Uh, because I lived with the Marines, I trained with the Marines, traveled with them, um, you know, ate, slept in the dirt with them. Uh, and uh, and was in you know stressful situations with them. Uh, the the dogs that we trained were all Labrador Retrievers. Um, it was the first time they had ever used a dog off leash for uh, bomb detection. And the advantage there, of course, is standoff. So uh, rather than having human personnel on a six foot leash with a dog um, who's at risk, obviously, of injury or death, um, the the dog could be sent in from extreme distances. I mean, uh, you know, two to 500 meters is not an exaggeration, um, depending on the environment, on the situation. Uh, but the dogs uh, also quartered, you know, quartered fields, quartered roads, ditches, bridges, culverts, vehicles, all kinds of things uh, as a pheasant dog would. Um, and then they ran uh, what they called, what the Marine Corps called point to points, which was would be a blind retrieve uh, for uh, you know, for a hunter, for a duck hunter or a field trialer. Um, and so the dog could be sent long distances, uh, check for threats, um, and they would act around the, the explosive the same way they would act around a bird. Um, the only difference is that they don't fetch it. 
they they are taught to give a passive response, which is to lay down and indicate uh, its location. And then they're called back uh, from that and then given a reward, which in our case was a rubber Kong toy. And um, and so to them, obviously, it's, it's serious business to us, but to them, it was really just another game. Um, and so they uh, were very good at this. I mean, we found stuff basically every week, sometimes every day. And uh, they saved a lot of limbs and a lot of lives uh, in that environment. Uh, and so it was, it was from that experience uh, when, I, when we came home, um, I always tell the story because it's uh, kind of apropos, I guess, but the, the dogs were heartbreakers for the Marines, okay? I mean, they, they lived with them for a long time. They had trusted them with their lives. They had uh, slept with them in their cots. And, um, and, to, and to come back from deployment and uh, have them go back into training and be assigned to a different handler uh, was very tough for, for most of them. And so I, I always say that they wanted to adopt all their dogs and they couldn't because they're still Marines. And I, right. wanted, to I wanted to adopt all the Marines because, uh, and I couldn't either um, because we were very close. So. Um, yeah, anyway, it was, it was a great experience. Uh, I still have many friends and contacts, uh, you know, through that experience. And, uh, and it was a life changer for me. Um, so after I came back, um, well, I, I was overseas seven months, back six months, and then overseas seven months. And so after coming back the second time, um, I returned to Minnesota and was still kind of in the fog of war, frankly. Um, I didn't, I had no interest in really hunting or training hunting dogs, certainly not family dogs. Everything seemed very trivial to me. Um, and I spoke at a, uh, a Rotary Club meeting and uh, there was a, a gentleman there that said, um, have you ever considered training, um, you know, service dogs for veterans? And we had just been talking about this at, uh, at, at our training center. Uh, and we're like, yeah, I wonder, you know, I wonder how we do this. I wonder if we would be good at it. Um, I wonder, you know, just I wonder. And, um, and so I said, uh, well, I, I don't think I'll be able to set up that business. And he said, well, I've set up many businesses. I'd be happy to set the business up for you if you would do it. And so that's how we started. Um, it was really just through a speaking engagement talking to a local group of Rotarians that uh, were interested in the, you know, in the experience and the, the assignment that I had with the Marine Corps. Um, and, and for me, it was, it was um, therapy in a way too, because uh, when I first came back, I was pretty raw about many things. Um, you know, thinking about um, many of the experiences we had was, you know, was emotional for me. And it still can be. Uh, but uh, through going, you know, going through this experience, and now we're nine years into training these service dogs for disabled military veterans, uh, it's gotten much easier, much better. I d have a different perspective on it. Um, and we're continuing to serve our country and serve our veterans, improve our community. I mean, these are all pretty, you know, pretty good um, experiences to have. Well, first of all, Sam, thank you very much for your service. Uh, you did provide a very important service to the Marines and, you know, especially with the bomb sniffing dogs. Um, and also, I think that's great that you found something you're passionate about that you can still serve. You know, you might not be active, you might not be directly supporting, but, you know, as we're all in this same thing together when it comes to mental health awareness, uh, especially for our veterans, uh, I guess we're just really appreciative that there's someone like you out there. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, the, um, most of the veterans that we serve, um, well, frankly, are suicidal and, uh, and have had attempts in the past. Um, they, they may have had addiction issues to alcohol or other substances. Uh, they've gone through a lot. And, uh, and so we make sure that they're stable and well enough to go through our program. But it's such a relief to them that they aren't they, they don't have somebody else another person feeding them medication so that is kind of the the go-to strategy 
for treatment uh, for, for mental health, for say major depressive disorder, anxiety, um, as is to prescribe medis medications. And as you all know, you know, I mean, as we all know, uh, there can be many side effects from that. Many times they're taking something to help them sleep because they have sleeping issues. And the veterans uh, then some can have trouble waking up and getting to a job or do some of the things that would be maybe what we would consider normal in a, in a society for a younger person to do. Um, and so it gets difficult when the medication interferes um, and certainly addictive medication that would interfere with uh, normal activity. Um, most of our veterans, you know, they, they frankly don't trust their own judgment. Um, and so sometimes um, they're quick to anger and in small things like if somebody cuts in front of you or I at the grocery store, we're, we may think they're rude or something to that effect, but uh, it may be a lot more personal to somebody that has post-traumatic stress and, and their, their anger can escalate quickly. And rather than saying something or doing something that becomes an issue, um, it's, it's easier for most of, most of these veterans to just isolate, stay home, uh, don't have a lot of interaction with, with people because you never know how things might have, might come out. Um, you know, we had one person that went into a, um, a convenience store early in the morning, five o'clock, five thirty, or something in the morning. And there was, uh, a guy that was half in the bag from the night before and he went up and started bear hugging the guy's dog. And, uh, and, he, and he asked him not to touch his dog, not to pet his dog. And then it was, well, what's your effing problem? And uh, then it escalated. And this, and this guy, uh, I, mean, he, he, I mean, he thought it was, he was going to jail after that. I mean, he thought that because of this interaction that his own behavior was going to be uh, the, the biggest issue uh, of the day there. And so rather than risk being in those unpredictable uh, behaviors or those situations where their behaviors can escalate, they, they tend to isolate. Well, when you have a service dog, um, well, for one thing, there's no medication, right? So a lot of, most all of our veterans can reduce or even eliminate many of their medications. And then the second thing is that the dog keeps them on a schedule. So now they have to get up in the morning because we have to get fed and we have to go potty mm -hmm. and uh, we have to get some exercise. Yeah. And, and so those are all reasons why uh, the dog can be a, 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 real, a real changing force um, that is totally organic and, and not like anything else. I want to rewind you just a little bit. Thank you for that explanation. That actually helps. Um, can you talk to us about believe it um mm -hmm. or believe that however you say yeah. it um yeah. uh how did you come up with that name first of all and then yeah. walk us through you you had already mentioned that somebody said they'd help you start it as a company but um if you could walk us through the beginning stages of how that all started sure yeah so um so our irs registered name is canine service partners incorporated and that's the 501c3 charity. Um, and we then adopted a, a, a trademark name um, that's, that's Believe It. And it's kind of a play on words, right? Believe It. Um, but we took the word believe and the word veteran, and we just combined the two. And then, ah. we, trademarked, and then we trademarked that name. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Um, so uh, so that, that was the origin of that. The origin of, of, of the starting of the company um, was my friend John Sinning, who was that businessman that was in the room uh, when I, you know, delivered that speaking engagement at the Rotary Club. And he came and, and said, I've set up many businesses. I'd be happy to set up uh, your 501c3, which is what he did. Um, he organized a lot of the administration aspects of it. And got us on some sort of trajectory in terms of what we were going to look at in terms of fundraising and uh, personnel and things like that. Now, as a dog trainer based in Northfield, I already had a facility and I, already, I also already had staff, um, experienced staff. 
And so it was really a, like a turnkey overnight um, process where we just said, we're going to get together and do this, and we're going to learn as much as we can about it. And so while, while John Sinning was ha handling all the administration part of it, um, all of our registrations and all those things that you do in a, in a new business, um, then we went to work on learning what our role needs, needs to be. And a lot, similarly to the bomb dog training with the Marine Corps, there, were, there isn't a lot of difference between what a hunting dog does chasing pheasants or retrieving ducks than what that bomb dog does. It's just a different uh, odor source in the end, a different target. Um, and there are, some, there are many similarities also between uh, those types of training and service dog work. So um, many of the things we were already capable of doing, uh, there were just some other you know, elements that frankly, you know, we just needed some experience on. So uh, we had uh, another gal uh, from, from Northfield and she came in with some experience training service dogs for canine companions for independence, which is the largest service dog training organization in the country. And so as she came in, shared what she knew, and then hopefully we shared what we knew with her, uh, we came up with a program that is, that's effective. And like I say, now we're nine years into it, uh, but without those, without those people and without that, that early uh, organization, we would, we would still be kind of flailing, I think, at this point. So, uh, yeah, so we're, uh, is that kind of answer your question about the origin or was there part missing there? Nope, nope, that, that does. Thank you for that explanation. All right. Just wanted to give some background, you know, sure. for our listeners. Yep. So, yeah, and I kind of want to talk about your introduction to the military side of things. You know, when you were approached to do canine training for the military, what did that look like? Yeah. So, well, first off, um, I, I would say both my parents uh, were in the Navy at the end of World War II. Uh, they met in San Diego uh, and eventually went to college on the GI Bill at, at Carleton College, uh, located in Northfield. And they had 10 kids and they bought a farm and raised us all. And it's a great American story. You know, it really is. Um, but for me, um, growing up hunting, um, I always wanted that, um, that hunting dog with me when I was hunting. Because what, there's nothing worse than to, you know, have a pheasant run away and you, know, you, can't, uh, you can't find it when it's got a broken wing. True, um, true. And so I used to borrow my neighbor's German Shepherd. Uh, and and I literally shot my first pheasant uh, over a German Shepherd, and uh, that's awesome. Yeah, the dog didn't retrieve it, but it did find it for me. Um, and so uh, I knew that as I you know I got older and, and and hunting especially expanded so much for me that I I really wanted to have my own dog. But at the time I was going to college at that point, St. Cloud State University. Uh, my roommate and I would run out to the Mille Lacs Lake Wildlife Management Area and hunt grouse. Um, and so, uh, you know, so I, but I didn't have a dog to pick them up. And as soon as I got out of college, I put a deposit on a puppy with Tom Dock and down in Northfield. And, uh, and, and then uh, I went back to Tom Dock and for some lessons. And so I, I read everything I could on training and practiced all these things on my new puppy. And then one day I was at uh, a sports show and Tom asked me if I would consider coming to work for him. And so I did that. So I, I worked for Tom for four years and I also started in the, in the fall, there weren't many dogs to train. So I started guiding uh, for hunting lodges out in South Dakota. And, you know, and it was just a, a natural progression uh, to start my own kennel after that. Um, so uh, remind me, Chris, what, where we were going with this about how you get to got into uh yeah. training for the military got it yeah so so then in um in 2009 i had a friend of mine who was actually already working for this company out in southern pines north carolina and they were looking for trainers they were looking for retriever trainers um and so they recruited me they called and said would you be interested in doing this i said sounds very interesting uh, i'd like to learn more and there were some delays at the beginning and finally, uh, 2010, uh, they, they pulled the trigger and said, all right, come on out. So with my wife's blessing, I have a good wife, by the way, of 28 years. 
Um, but with her blessing, I moved to, uh, to Carthage, North Carolina, just north of uh, Southern Pines there, and started training dogs. And like I said, I, I was a trainer. I could handle the volume, you know, have 18 or 20 dogs on a trailer. I knew how to handle that kind of volume. The skills that they needed to learn in terms of uh, quartering a field or quartering an area um, and running point to point, uh, that is running blind type retrieves, um, those were right, you know, right in my wheelhouse. So that part was, was um, you know, was not difficult. Uh, but what, what that spiraled into or blossomed into uh, was when they asked me if I would consider to go overseas and be deployed with the, with the Marine Corps. Uh, that was a big day. I mean, obviously, and I told them, uh, you know, I'm uh, honored to do that and uh, thankful that they would think of me in that regard. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm, I wasn't just doing, uh, you know, the humble pie thing. I mean, I, I was seriously, uh, struck in that way. Um, and so I just tried to, um, make sure that I was an asset to the unit, uh, especially the second battalion, fifth Marines, um, going on a, on a combat deployment. Um, I, you know, I wanted to make sure I could, you know, handle my own gear get myself around, make sure that I wasn't holding anybody up and, uh, and wasn't in, in some way a distraction. And the same for the program. So we had 34 dogs uh, with that battalion in country and uh, we had 31 handlers. So we had uh, three dogs that were replacement dogs for dogs that may be killed or injured. And, and, uh, and we, we did utilize one of those. Um, but, uh, and then the, then the dogs were set up all over the AO. So we had, you know, five, five or six different operating forward operating bases where they were, those 31 dogs were divided between, but it all went back, you know, to the original phone call, um, where, you know, Hey, we, somebody brought your name up and we, you know, we are wondering if you'd be considered doing this. And, uh, if you remember what 2008 and nine were like for the economy, um, you can probably get kind of a, a sense too of what a big opportunity this was. So for Absolutely. a small business guy, um, I mean, sometimes I always say that people will spend more on what they want rather than what they need. Um, but uh, dog training was slow, uh, travel was slow. So we didn't do a lot of boarding either at the kennel. And so my receipts, my sales were down and it was just a, you know, a fortuitous um, blessing uh, that I was able to, you know, to, to step up there. So what did that conversation look like with your wife and family when that, when that came up? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I guess I would say that, I, you know, my wife and I do not have any children. So that was, you know, that was off the table. And like I said, when I first started training dogs, there were no dogs to train in the fall because they all went hunting. And so in order to earn some money and to earn, earn income and stay busy in the fall, I started working for these hunting lodges in the fall in South Dakota. And so I already had a little bit of a track record of, you know, disappearing for extended periods of time, um, but nothing like three years, you know, or, or you know, three plus years. Um, and I, you know, I decided to get leave and I, did, I was able to get home uh, on, on a few occasions, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was obviously a, a big decision. I really, really wanted to do it as, as soon as I learned about the program, I surprisingly found the, uh, the, what they call the IDD, the improvised explosive, explosive device detection dog training manual that was online. So I printed it off, put it in a book, read everything about it. So when I got there, um, I, I frankly, I had more of a sense of what the program was than, than a lot of other people did. Um, but again, it was in my wheelhouse, so it was not uncomfortable or, uh, or awkward in any way. Uh, that's pretty interesting. Now it's, uh, so the bonds that have been built with the Marines when you went over there too, obviously those are, you alluded to that earlier, you know, you wanted to adopt them. Um, so when you were overseas with them and embedded with them, essentially, were you going outside the wire and working with the dogs outside the wire with them? Yeah, so I, I was technically not allowed outside the wire, but we did get outside the wire. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, probably, well, I don't know if it's the most important or not, but I would say our, definitely our largest um, find of the deployment was outside the wire. 
and uh and so yeah it was it was a car bomb and uh, we didn't see we, we saw a lot of fairly crude homemade uh devices that were obviously still very dangerous but we weren't seeing a lot of modern explosives we weren't seeing a lot of remote control detonations um things were you know wood you know homemade wooden pressure plates and and uh, pull strings and uh, things that were, you know, available to, you know, to the local people at the time to use to make explosives. Um, and so when we, uh, this was April 15th, uh, 2012, of course, I'll never forget the date. But um, yeah, so uh, the, we, had a, we had a car and the, the dog indicated on a, on a car. Well, we always had bulletins about white Toyota Corollas, you know, like be on a lookout for a possible VA, you know, uh, V-bid. Pretty common vehicle. Yeah, right. And, and this was a white Toyota Corolla, but, uh, you know, we kind of uh, took that with a grain of salt because every day there was that kind of uh, bulletin on that. Um, well, the dog uh, hit on the car, um, got excited around it, just like it would around a, a wad of cattails that's got a pheasant in it. Um, gets excited, figures out exactly where it's located in the car, and then lays down and stares at it. And so we called the dog back and the handler's paying, what we call paying the dog with, the, with his Kong. And I'm like, uh, what are you paying? You know, what are you paying this dog for? Cause I didn't see him. I didn't see him go in there. And he said, well, he indicated on this car. And I'm like, holy, you know what? And so then we sent in a second dog and uh, the second dog also indicated in the exact same spot. And so we knew something was very shady about that car. Um, and uh, eventually EOD um, made, it, you know, made it safe and they pulled it out into a dried riverbed and detonated it. Um, but there were, there were a dozen Marines standing around it. I was standing around it. There was a eight or ten Afghan National Police standing around it. It would have been devastating if it had it gone off there. Um, so that was, that was a big, big day. You know? No, that's pretty incredible when you think about, you know, these these creatures have gotten on earth that are able to help and work alongside you and be able yeah. to detect something right. that could potentially kill you all. And it's, that's just amazing. And, you know, I'm glad there's uh, individuals like yourself out there that have that knowledge and ability to be able to pass that training abilities on to these animals, but also use them for a greater cause and good. So that's pretty awesome. of you. Yeah. And, and I, I was, like you say, I was very blessed uh, um, because uh, my our, our battalion command uh, took the asset seriously, um, implemented the program, and utilized them in a way that some did not. Uh, and so I had a lot of support from the command in that regard, which which made it made it easier for everyone. Uh, dogs are very integrated into our homeland security. You know, I mean, you can't go to an airport without seeing them or. You know, uh, several events that are housed that are large scale events across the country that, you know, we have canines that protecting our people, you know, and so why not have them overseas protecting our soldiers too? Right. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about your training team. I'm looking at your website right now and so you got a, a robust crowd of people that are helping you volunteers or. Yes. Yeah, so we do have some, uh, so Northville Kennels, you know, my original business uh, had the staff. We had skilled and experienced trainers. Um, and so they have run dogs at all the um, uh, AKC performance event levels. So junior, senior, master level. Uh, and, and they train a lot of gun dogs. We fix, we fix a lot of problems, frankly. So. Um, we don't get in high caliber uh, talent that we can then mold into some sort of winner. We usually are getting my in G dogs. GSP? Dogs, pardon me? I can, send my, I can send you my GSP and we'll see if that works. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, like <laughs> I say, um, we're getting dogs off the street that usually have problems. And, uh, and so we're, we're fixing those in, in you know, the ways we know how. Um, on the service dog side, uh, we have a very high standard. You know, I, I wouldn't say to you, um, gee, your, your German short here is um, not very birdie, um, won't go in the water, um, and, you know, and it has, has a problem. What I would do is I'd 
just try to level with you in terms of the limitations of your dog and say, we're going to do everything we can to pump them up and make sure their attitude's good and they're having fun. And then we're going to try to get as much obedience and control to go along with that. Um, but we're, you know, in the end of the day, um, if he's not steady on point, uh, but he still finds the bird and he retrieves it for you, I mean, that's a pretty good outcome. On the other hand, if somebody's put so much pressure on him that he's afraid of the bird and blinks it um, or uh, is repulsed by it, which happens sometimes, or, you know, the dog won't retrieve, go to the bird and retrieve, well, uh, that's not as good of an outcome. So it's always sort of a trade-off. What can you get? What can you get out of them? Um, you know, what what do you have to sacrifice or, or in terms of lowering your standard? Um, so with the service dogs, there is no lowering of the standard. Uh, if, if there's any reason that the dog is not suitable as a service animal, we will release them from the program. And so with, it's probably 30% uh, of our dogs that we're doing that with uh, for one reason or another. So maybe we were at the grocery store and the dog growled at a child. Um, or maybe they have uh, a barking compulsion that we cannot get in front of. Um, or maybe there's a physical issue. You know, they've got hips or eyes or elbows or something which are, uh, you know, are, are going to be problematic for, for an owner. Uh, we don't want to sock somebody uh, with a, you know, a golden doodle with uh, skin problems because they're never going to get over their skin problems. Uh, it's, they're going to have to maintain it and treat it their whole life. And that's not what we want to, you know, want to put them in that situation. So there are many of those dogs that 30% are totally adequate and, and acceptable uh, family dogs and companion dogs. Um, but they're not going to get on an airplane and fly someplace or go to somebody's workplace every day and and uh, be that that service animal. So, uh, yeah, so we do have, uh, you know, a percentage of dogs that we release because we have a high standard. Um, but we're not going to, we don't do trade-offs. We don't do compromises. We don't, um, you know, we, we have a high standard and we stick to it because these dogs are not being handled by somebody like myself who's a professional handler who can do a lot of things with a lot of, in a lot of different ways. These, these folks are just regular people and some have never owned a dog before. So as they uh, are challenged with uh, the handling responsibilities of the dog, they're going to have to, uh, you know, have something that's pretty malleable, something that's pretty easy, easy to handle and, and, uh, and cooperative. Does that make sense? It does. Uh, can you walk us through the process you use to train these dogs? I mean, obviously, I know it's a yeah. long process. It's very, it, yeah. it takes, you know, over a year. But can you give us an abbreviated version of, of what that process looks like? Sure. Um, yeah, the abbreviated version is that we'll take a puppy or a young dog, whether we adopt that from a shelter or a rescue um, dog that we, you know, we're going to, take the chance on, take a risk on and say, we think this dog looks pretty darn good for what, for what our program is. Um, or a puppy that's donated to us. Uh, you know, we've had breeders uh, all over donate puppies to us and uh, they don't, of course, they don't all make it either. Um, but we'll take that puppy that's uh, seven or eight or nine weeks old and we'll put it in a foster home. So for about six to eight months, that puppy's going to be being potty trained, uh, started obedience and been around kids and go, going lots of places, car rides and all the experiences that a young dog can, can be socialized into. Um, and then at that point, that maybe that nine, 10, 11 month old young dog will come into the training center full time. And that means, and what full times means is that we, we train them five days a week and on the weekends, their, their full-time foster now becomes a weekend foster. So rather than sitting there and staring at the walls all weekend, um, they get picked up on Friday, they get to go home and be with the family that they already know, and they come back on Sunday night or Monday morning to start their training week again. Um, and so that goes on for quite some time. That, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, close to a year right there. So now they're almost a year old. Now they're gonna be in training for a year and now the dog is getting pretty close, 90% close to finished. 
um, we're going to so start selecting a veteran handler for that dog. And typically what we do is match the dog to the person. That is, um, if somebody is maybe younger, high energy, wants to go hike the mountains, um, we're going to give them a dog, prepare them with a dog that is similarly, uh, you know, um, with that disposition. And if we have a Vietnam veteran who's 75 and really needs more of, of someone to help him brace, uh, to steady him, to help him get up out of a chair, um, to retrieve dropped items, um, things like that, and, and, and they need a quieter dog that's not going to pull on them ever, uh, then we're going to select a dog that meets the, that criteria and match them up together. So uh, that it, and I think, you know, in nine years, I think we've gotten it wrong twice. So, I mean, our people are really good at pairing up those dogs with the veterans. And, uh, and so, and, and with, with the, the, the two that we didn't pair up uh, appropriately, uh, we repaired them with a different, uh, different animal that was successful. So, um, but it's all a learning process, right? So there's, there's a lot of basic um, skills, uh, the same things your hunting dogs use, you know, heel, sit, stay, come down, that kind of thing. Uh, go, stop, and come, essentially. Um, go would be if I needed him to fetch something and I had to tell him to go over there and get my medicine bottle or my car keys or my phone that I dropped in the snow and can't find. Um, that you know The dog can hunt those things and retrieve. If I ha they just have to be obedient when I tell them to go do that. And then uh, also uh, go, would an example of go would be like getting into the kennel, getting the, into the car, um, not when you feel like it, not, not when you get around to it, but I mean, you need to get in there now. And so again, those are all things that are ap you know, applicable to both the, the hunter and hunting dog and the, and frankly, the bomb dog too, but also the service dog, certainly. Um, and so the, the, the main thing that we're doing differently is customizing the service skills. So if somebody um, maybe has a spinal injury and, and has some paralysis. We're going to train a dog that might need to pull a wheelchair or stop a wheelchair and certainly retrieve dropped items. Um, many other things, push handicap buttons uh, to get into buildings. Um, and so that's going to be, you know, specifically custom trained for that individual, just as it would for a more psychiatric uh, geared patient like uh, like a post-traumatic stress uh, situation, military sexual trauma, uh, very prevalent. Um, and so, so on the psychiatric side, we're going to be teaching that dog to respond to, um, to emotions a lot. So, uh, signs of sadness, signs of, uh, of, of anxiousness, uh, anxiety, um, as, as someone gets angry, their, their, the cadence of their voice may change. The pitch of it may change. Certainly, the volume may change. They may emit an odor, uh, a sweat-type odor. Um, so, so it, it's based on the individual. Um, some and everyone has different hobbies, and they live in different uh, situations. So, uh, if it's if the dog's going to live in an apartment versus live in a house versus live on acreage, um, and so all those things are are taken into account when we're trying to customize that dog for that particular environment. Um, and then their workplace would be the same. So some people are going to work in an office, uh, um, maybe a building where they have to ride an elevator. Um, some people may work in a warehouse where there's loud noises and machinery. Um, so all those things are custom trained uh, per individual. Um, so that that's really the biggest way it differs. And I guess you could say that with your hunting dog too, you know, that if you're strictly a duck hunter or strictly a field trialer, for example, um, you're probably never going to upland hunt your dog because it kind of goes against what field trialers are doing. Um, and so it, it might be similar that way where you would, you'd certainly, you know, if, if a Labrador points a bird, well, it might be sort of a bonus, but it's not really, you know, top on the list. The main thing is, will they get in that cold water and bring me my bird back so I don't have to? Uh, right. And so, you know, there are some parallels uh, specifically for their task. How many dogs have you trained so far? We just placed our 62nd uh, team. So that's a veteran and a dog team. 
uh, that was uh, this summer, and we just had we had a graduation uh, just last month, uh, also um, over in, in Shakopee, Minnesota. But um, congratulations! I yeah, mean, thank- when you look at when you look at the amount of time it takes you to train these dogs, and you've been at you know for the the years you've been doing this, right. that's a lot of dogs in what nine years? Right, nine years. Yeah. Uh, and, and we didn't do any the first year, of course, uh, and we only did one the second year. So, uh, so yeah, we've, you know, but, you know, that's, that's because it takes, it takes time to, you know, to do this. You can't just, it's not like a, a tool you can bolt together and, and you have it ready. You know, it's a, it takes time to do it. So, um, so tell me yeah. about this. Mm-hmm. Tell me about the selection process then for the veteran. Yeah. How do you select who? is eligible for this program? Yeah, good question. So the, the first thing that we do is uh, we, we get an eligibility survey submitted to us. So on our website, under veterans, uh, you can you can choose eligibility survey. It takes about five minutes to fill it out. Just, it's all the contact information and things that so that we can, you know, communicate back and forth. And then we have to, of course, we have to determine that they're actually who they say they are and that they're actually a veteran. So we, we get a DD-214 copy. Um, and we ask some very basic questions like, um, do, you, do you understand the responsibility of having a dog? Do you know that there's going to be some, some expense in having a dog? And, and do you agree to those things? Um, and then on the mental health side, we ask, you know, are you engaged with the therapist or a counselor? And um, do you agree to continue to be engaged with your therapist and counselor? Um, that's, that's about as simple as it gets right there. And then once we get the eligibility survey in, uh, then we will, uh, as long as everything checks out in a satisfactory way, which, which we haven't had anyone try to, you know, get by with it, anything now uh, up to this point, but we'll, then we'll send them the full, a full application. And that's a little more involved, as you might imagine. So uh, we're going to get um, letters of recommendation from their healthcare professionals. That can be a, the hardest thing because they don't respond to them. Um, the healthcare professionals are difficult to get a hold of and difficult to get a response from. And uh, these are typically VA health health care providers. Um, we're going to get a list of their medications, the reasons for taking their medications, and get also get an idea of their living environment. So that uh, did they have a fenced yard? Um, do they, you know, do they actually have an appropriate place where they can uh, keep a dog? Once we have all that information back in, then we actually have a committee. Um, we're very lucky. I, I know other organizations that really are just flipping a coin, frankly. And we have, we actually have a committee of healthcare professionals that are that are experienced in post traumatic stress counseling and the medical fields. So those folks then go through the applications and say, we'd really like to look at these people. Um, so the, the, the reasons that we would reject one or, or not pursue an applicant is usually because they, they either have an addiction issue or they haven't been um, through treatment for that addiction issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, I certainly, as a dog trainer, I certainly can't de- determine um, who is serious about recovery and who is not. And so that's why we have those healthcare professionals uh, that go through those things and know how to how to read this this kind of thing, um, so that we can get people in the door um, who we really want to have on our campus um, that we can really help and uh, and are appreciative of what we do. I really appreciate that you do that. Yeah. So if people want to help you. How can they do that? What what can people do that maybe not are not in the dog world? What can they do to support your organization? Yeah. So I talked a little bit earlier about some of our, our employees. Uh, they're Northfield Kennels employees. I uh, believe it um, is, is, is just starting to um, get in a position where they can have their own employees, frankly. Um, so m- most of the things that we do are, are volunteer. I'm a hundred percent volunteer. I don't, I don't get paid. Um, and the volunteers, uh, we could not do what we do without the volunteers. So uh, in some, 
in some regards, they give us credibility because it brings the veterans out of the woodwork to a, a place in a, in a beautiful rural setting where they feel comfortable and, and like they can trust the people around them. Um, and then the veterans come in and help us. They uh, appear at events and at, um, you know, speaking engagements, uh, state fair, uh, you know, any, any number of things. Uh, they, they get involved in terms of fostering our puppies, finding foster, other fosters for the puppies, transportation. Dog has to go to the vet or uh, a veteran needs something someplace. Um, and it's just, it's just a tremendous um, help. And one thing I would say uh, that people should know about us is that our program, we're, you know, our name is Canine Service Partners. Um, it's really not about the dogs. Frankly, it's about people. So, um, yeah, we do certainly do an awful lot with the dogs, uh, and and they're, you know, the biggest part. But but it's really about the people, about um, changing someone's life from being isolated to being free, uh, to living a more freedom filled life, um, to doing the things that they used to do, uh, that they thought they would never do again. Um, like it could be simple as having a a, a strong relationship, uh, having um, children, children maybe someday, having a job that is steady and that it meets their needs. Um, maybe it's hunting, okay, hunting and fishing. Um, we have a lot of guys uh, who, and, and gals, um, who uh, used to do this with grandpa or with dad, and they haven't done it since they were 12 or 14 years old, and they really never thought they would do it again. But now that they have this dog, they think, what would what would it take to get this dog gun broke? What would it take to get this dog on a few pigeons where he didn't, you know, he or she would know what what's going on out there? And it'd be pretty pretty fun to dream, be pretty pretty fun to dream again and have hope about doing those things. Uh, is there somewhere people can donate to help you out? Yeah, certainly on our on our website is a, is a great way. Um, they have give to the max days and all those kinds of things, but those organizations take a, a pretty good percentage of the donation donated amount. So frankly, writing us a check or making a donation in another way, we've had people donate stock to us. Um, yeah. And, or host events for us. So, um, you know, whether it's a, a dinner, um, or some kind of, uh, you know, musical, we've done, you know, plays and uh, concerts. Um, and other types of speaking engagements, and they've they've been to to benefit us, you know. So why why are you doing your garage sale this week? Well, we're doing it to, you know, to benefit. Believe it, but it helps us get out awareness of this issue, right? Because Minnesota alone, you know, loses uh, average two veterans a week to suicide. It's about a hundred a year just in Minnesota, and um, and so that awareness has to be out there. Uh, what we are doing. Uh, it, it absolutely uh, affects the veterans who have been suicidal or have thought about being suicidal. We save lives. I mean, it, I can hardly get myself to say that because it, it just seems like I'm bragging. Um, but if it, if it motivates someone else to learn about what we do and to appreciate the issues involved here uh, with, with veterans, um, then it's, it's, it's worth it. So, uh, but yeah, certainly donating on our website, hosting an event for us, even coming and helping us with one of our events, our golf tournament or our spring gala or uh, any of the other events that we do throughout the year. Invite us to come talk to your groups, um, your, your, your businesses, your, uh, your community groups, your churches, um, your schools. Uh, we've been in all these places and it just helps create the awareness of, of what we're doing and why, why we're doing it. And of course the dogs are always a big hit. Uh, yeah, they, I'll come in and they won't remember my name, but they remember my dog Taffy, you know? Uh, but, um, so yeah, we definitely bring the dogs along, but it's, uh, those are, those are the things that, yeah, you know, we're, we have a, a new building planned right now. Um, we have a, a site, uh, which is right next door to our current training center for a 13,000 square foot uh, training center uh, with our own veterinary clinic, um, um, 109 dog capacity. And uh, obviously it's a very big and expensive 
uh, you know, project. But um, those are our dreams. Everybody has to have audacious goals. And, uh, and so we intend to, uh, in some year, probably not three years, maybe five, definitely 10, we're going to arrest that 100 veterans a year in Minnesota. That's awesome. No, that's a really good goal. And I just, uh, you guys are doing good work and I really appreciate that. You know, there's a lot to be said about, like I said, the Canadian partners and, and um, our soldiers and our veterans and how, what kind of bond that can create and help save these lives. So no, I really appreciate everything you guys are doing. Um, so it's a very good program and, and it's a cool part here in Minnesota here. And so are we, we're also in other states, but this is our home state. Uh, so no, thank you, Sam, for everything you're doing. Where where are you tonight? Are you out in a hunting camp? I am. I'm in I'm in Gregory, South Dakota, in the in the beautiful uh, Ooh, that's yeah, pheasant hunt butte, there. yeah, kind of butte country in the in the Golden Triangle or whatever they call it here. But yeah, so I'm out out at uh, Buffalo Butte Ranch in Gregory, South Dakota, and uh, it's it's been great. But we're gonna get some cold weather coming up here quite soon. Yeah, you're not kidding. So, no, thank you for taking time with us tonight with you being on your hunting trip and everything. So it's spectacular doing that. So if our listeners want to get a hold of you or find you, how, how can they find you on social media, website? Yes, certainly Facebook, uh, certainly our website, www.believeit.org. Um, if you just search Service Dogs Minnesota, um, certainly Service Dogs for Veterans Minnesota, it will we'll come up. Um and uh, yeah, certainly that way. We also have, um, it's at the, yeah, I'm not big on social media because I'm over 50, but uh, <laughs> yeah. And like I, I told Phil in the email, I still have an eight track tape stereo, uh, but I still yeah, got a I record think, player. I'm over 52. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have, uh, yeah, we, I don't know if we have Twitter, what we have, but I mean, we're out there. It, we're not that hard to find anymore. That's awesome. Yeah. No, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you being here tonight. And do you have any final comments before we start wrapping up? We're coming up in an hour here. Well, this is the first podcast I've ever done uh, or ever even maybe heard of. Um, so I know it was easy as as easy as can be. And uh, the awareness of what we're doing is is the real key. I mean, it'd be great to have uh, a lot of money in the bank and build what we want to build and have that all. Uh, buttoned up, but that's not how most uh, most places operate, and uh, we're certainly no different. Um, the awareness, if you know somebody, um, tell them. If you know if you know somebody that can use our services, tell tell them tell them about us because uh, we are not far away, and it's a hundred percent free. Uh, the only thing the only thing the veteran is responsible for is getting themselves there. So uh, there's no cost to the veteran uh, for the for their service dog. Um, their skin in the game, frankly, is that they have to do 120 hours of team training one on one with our trainers. Um, it usually takes two to three months to to knock out that 120 hours, and uh, and then we'll at that point, you know, you're you're really on your way. So um, yeah, if you know somebody that can use our our help. Tell them about us, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Our Absolutely. listeners will definitely spread the word. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Phil, Phil, do you have any final comments? No, I just want to thank Sam again for, for coming on and uh, being able to, like I said, share with our audience because we do have a similar mission. We're all about saving people's lives, right? You know, it's it's about that number. And regardless if it's the 22 a day across the country or if it's two a day, two a week in Minnesota, like you mentioned, it's too many. And so your mission for your organization, the mission of Hometown Hero Outdoors is the mental health awareness. And uh, like Chris says, keeping people on the planet. So I appreciate and we thank you for what you do. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks again, Sam. Really appreciate you. So for our listeners, uh, we're at Believe It, the uh, canine training program that's based out of Northfield, Minnesota. And we thank you for joining us tonight. And for our listeners, in the event you find yourself in a dark place, there's a lot of people that are here for you. Like I talked about earlier in the podcast, there are people out there that believe in you and want you here. But if you're feeling yourself in a dark time, 
Our field staff are trained in Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training it's a CIS program, Crisis Intervention, and we are here to listen. We have a list of individuals that engage or have been trained in ASSIST. And please reach out to us on any social media, emails, whatever you can do to find us, please find us. But if you can't and you're having issues, you can call 988. Text or call 988 for the Crisis Suicide Prevention Line. So we want you here, fight another day, and be here for your loved ones in the future and enjoy your life. For today, that is all we have on the podcast. I want to thank David and Sam Daly here for giving their time while he's out on a phenomenal pheasant hunting trip. And I appreciate everyone that joined us. Thank you, Phil. And until next week, we will see everyone on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hometown Hero Outdoors podcast. For more information, visit our website at hometownherooutdoors.org.